Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, last session, last, last, last webinar of the Open Education Week that has been organized by Eden in the framework, of course, of the, um, coordinate, the, the initiative that is coordinated by the um, Open Education Global. Uh, as you most probably know, this is an, an initiative that uh, Eden has been um, organizing uh, every year in the last couple of years. And basically, we try to explore um, the, the, to the hot topics of open education uh, in connection with also the developments in, uh, in our field. And this year, uh, this past year, and still this year, uh, the, uh, our, the, our field has been dominated by the discussion on our response to the pandemic and the challenges of the pandemic. Um, I will start by, um, uh, if, if you will give you some, some notes regarding how the, the session will, will, uh, will, will be conducted. So you can, um, I'll start by introducing the topic and the speakers, and then we'll have, each one will have, uh, well, a brief uh, period of time, some 10, 10, 12 minutes to present their initial case. Um, afterwards, we'll have a discussion and a Q&A. And so we are all invited to already um, share your questions. And you can use both the Q&A, especially the Q&A, uh, but also if, if needed, the chat. But we would like to, uh, to invite you to use the Q&A option, which you can find on the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll, I'll now share my screen uh, to introduce uh, the, the speakers. So as you as you know, um, this the session this session has the top uh, has selected as topic. Also, just a minute, okay. Has selected as topic supporting teaching and learning in schools through open educational resources. The lessons from the pandemic. We have a wonderful uh, set of um, uh, speakers. Uh, and I'll just give a, a short note on each one of them. First, we'll have Abby Ross. She is the Chief Executive Officer of Koriki in the United States. And uh, as you can see here uh, in the slide as well, Abby is a seasoned technology entrepreneur with a passion and background in education technology. She started her career in product management at a startup that grew to 10 million users and was acquired by Expedia, uh, Expedia in 2010. Abby then led the strategy and growth of a web and mobile development firm as a managing partner. In 2013, Abby co-founded ThinkCircle, a venture-backed education technology company focused on helping build uh, critical thinking skills through writing across the curriculum. Abby was integral in raising over $20 million in capital across three rounds of funding, developing Think Circus initial product offering and go-to-market strategy to launch as an enter enterprise K-12 program. Uh, so she's a very experienced um, uh, entrepreneur in, in, this, in this field, and she's now the, uh, the leader of Kuriki in this uh, phase. Next, we'll have also Agda Graz Velasquez, uh, she is the science pro uh, program manager and head of science of the science education department of the European School Net. Uh, Dr. Agda Graz Velasquez. Agda is the sci um, she is the uh, as I uh, just pointed out. She is in charge of overseeing and coordinating all the math and science projects in which the European uh, School Net is involved. Additionally, she is in charge of the day to day management of the Scientix the Community for Science Education in Europe, and she'll be talking about this. And she coordinates the UN's work with regions and the UN's ministries of education, STEM representatives working group. In her eight years at the UN, Agda has been involved in over 25 European Commission funded projects and 12 private funded ones, and also sits in the advisory board of a number of projects. Uh, well, interestingly, uh, prior to joining UN, uh, she was an independent e-learning professional, and she was um, also she has also a PhD in astrophysics from Trinity College Dublin. So she she, she has a very solid uh, scientific background. Also, we'll have uh, Andrea Inamorat dos Santos. 
She's um, uh, a scientific officer at the uh, Joint Research uh, Center at the European Commission, uh, which in which she joined in uh, September 2013. Her role involves research and policy support on ICT for learning skills and open educational resources. Her work contributes to finding opportunities and challenges of ICT and OER implementation at the policy level to innovate and modernize teaching, learning, and training practices in Europe. Her current focus is on the promotion and uptake of openness in higher education institutions and member states. Uh, she has a PhD in education technology from the Open University of the United Kingdom. And uh, she is also, uh, she has worked uh, extensively as a researcher um, and also as a, a consultant. Um, Andre produced the national report on OER in Brazil, which was published by the UNESCO in 2011. Um, next, we'll have uh, Dr. Sophocles Sotirio. She, he's, uh, well, a, a Indian uh, fellow and also the research and development department, uh, had, the head of the research and development department of the Elinor Germaniki Agogi uh, in Athens, Greece. Greece. Uh, he has worked at CERN, at the National Center for Scientific Research Democritus in Athens, and also the Physics Laboratory of the Athens University. He holds a PhD in high energy neutrino astrophysics, also an astrophysicist, and a PhD in science education. Um, the Elena, Elino Germaniki Agogi is one of the biggest educational institutions in Greece. And he has been quite active in the coordination and development of research projects on implementation for advanced technologies uh, and, and in science education and training. He's also director of the um, uh, Elino Germaniki Agogi Center for Teachers Training. His main uh, field is the design, application, and evaluation of training. He's a member of the European Academy, Academy of Sciences and the board of uh, Excite and has served in, as an expert evaluator to the European Commission for the FP5 and FP7 programs. Finally, we'll have uh, te Professor Tela Miel. Uh, he is the director of the UNESCO Chair in Distance Education of the University of Brasilia. Uh, he's a professor of the, in the Department of Methods and Techniques at the Faculty of Education of the University of Brasilia, where he coordinates the distance pedagogy course. Uh, he's coordinator of the UNESCO Chair, as I've said, and, um, and has coordinated also the UNESCO Chair in Open Education at UNICAMP uh, from 2014 to 2018. He was a visiting professor at Utah State University and a visiting fellow at the Stanford University and University of Wollongong. Um, as, you, as you just uh, could see, um, we have a, 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 an expert uh, panel um, uh, and we'll be starting now uh, with the, the discussion of our topic. And I'll start by inviting uh, Abby to uh, pre to well to make her presentation. Abby, please. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here and uh, with such great panelists, um, with such a great organization. <clears throat> so I am going to um, speak a little bit about Curriki and um, you know welcome any questions around technology and, and open educational resources. Um, so at Curriki, we are shaping the future of learning. We have created a free and open source technology to create interactive learning experiences. Ultimately, Curriki has been around since 2008. Uh, we started by, uh, we created an, an OER for teachers. It was basically a repository um, where teachers could post their curriculum, lesson plans, on-demand content. Um, and we had grown to about half a million lesson plans and example lessons uh, for teachers to share. So if you needed to um, you know, teach something on Pythagorean theorem, uh, you could go to the library and find something from another educator. Um, we took a look at that content over the past, um, you know, two years or so. And what we realized uh, was, you know, the quality of the lesson plans uh, in there just weren't as high quality as we needed with, you know, the pandemic and the shift to distance and global learning. So uh, we started building technology about two years ago, and uh, we've introduced an open source authoring and publishing tool to make learning interactive for students. So I'll show you that uh, authoring tool today, which is called Curriki Studio. 
It's comprised of 50 learning interaction types that you can pull from things like drag and drop, interactive video, 360 tour. Um, because it's an authoring tool, it then allows any educator to instantly publish a lesson or a course that they've created to any learning management system. Um, we have decided that our place in this ecosystem is to build sustainable technology and architecture so that other organizations can build off of um, this authoring tool and incorporate it in. So, um, you know, the, the organizations that we work with are uh, schools and districts who want to make their lesson plans dynamic and interactive for students. We work with publishing companies uh, or subject matter experts that have content. And instead of using a static PDF emailed to students, you can make a dynamic learning playlist. And with our sustainable technology architecture, developers from organization, technology organizations can build off of, on top of it, integrate it into their technology stack, <clears throat> and, and go to market quicker. So that's what Curriculum Studio is, uh, the future of learning all in one place. It's a content authoring and publishing solution so that you can create and manage dynamic learning experiences for any of your users. Um, this is kind of a, a summary. So when you think about uh, some of the, the learning uh, that we're asking students to do, you know, sending them to one-off pages, static PDFs, or limited interactions like multiple choice, uh, you know, fill in the blank or text response. We are empowering curriculum and curriculum creators to transform to interactive playlists that truly drive student engagement. Um, so there's 50 interactive activity types. You can one-click publish to any configured learning management system. Authors can arrange their lessons in playlists uh, into a scope and sequence. And anything created with Curriculum Studio is mobile optimized by design. So the 50 different learning activity types that we have um, are really used for um, learning designers can leverage them from pre-K all the way to gray learners. Um, it's just the matter of the rigor of the content that you add to the technology. So examples include drag and drop, an essay, fill in the blank, a little memory game, interactive video. And it's our goal with this open source technology to go from 50 learning activity types to 500. So imagine being a uh, content creator uh, or an instructional designer and being able to incorporate VR and AR for immersive experience and then add in a quiz at the end, uh, putting in badges and leaderboards to gamify the experience for your learners. That's really what we're creating at Curriki Studio. Um, and all of our roadmap is driven by feedback from authors and students. So if you are uh, building in Curriculum Studio and say, hey, this essay tool is okay, but what we really want is the ability for students to collaborate while they're writing, those will be the types of integrations that we're looking to build in. So the flow with Curriculum Studio is create a learning project, find, uh, pull from those different learning activity types, Add your content to those activities, create a playlist, arrange and rearrange them in whatever order you want. And then you have an option to enable distribution to your environment. That can be embedding it into a website, into a learning management system like Moodle, Canvas, Schoology, or Google Classroom. And then learners can engage with what you've created. Um, and all of the grades can then be passed back to the learning management system. So when we think about the future of teaching and learning with open educational resources, this can be a great way for teachers to um, build and launch interactive learning and then see how students are doing that directly where they're already doing their work, likely their learning management system. So I want to share a couple of examples. Um, and I'm happy to throw these in the chat after I'm done speaking so you can kind of see when I say an interactive playlist, what do I mean? Um, so Civicate, uh, I am based in the US here, um, and Civicate is a curriculum uh, actually designed by a high school student to make sure that all students have a good understanding of government. Um, so we worked with uh, Civicate. We partnered them with one of our certified Curriculum Studio authors uh, to turn their videos interactive. So they had a series of different videos. And what we essentially did was uh, used our interactive video tool. And along the way throughout the video, there's little pop-ups with questions, 
you can award points. And within the interactive video, uh, you can do multiple choice, drag and drop, free response, um, and just making that content more dynamic so that learners can engage instead of just watching a 20 minute video, they're prompted to lean in and engage with the content. Another example for the higher education market um, is we've been working with a renowned entrepreneur, Raul Deju, um, and he has a course called How to Become a Successful Entrepreneur. This course was basically um, you know, a series of YouTube videos that he would email out to uh, his students. So what we did is we took our interactive book functionality and we created an interactive self-paced course about learning how to start a business and it's targeted to higher education and adult learners. So what this means is that any higher education institution can go to Raul Deju's website and one click request that it gets sent to their learning management system so university professors can easily incorporate it into their curriculum and they can also have their students go through it independently and get certified at the end. Uh, another example I want to share is how other technology companies are using Curriculum Studio. So Vivenci is a social emotional learning platform. Uh, you know, I'd consider them a, a little bit of an up and comer startup. Um, and they've used uh, Curriculum Studio as a way to go to market faster. So they were building technology for their social emotional learning platform um, and decided to use Curriculum Studio to author all of their curriculum helping their developers reallocate resources to be able to focus on things like analytics and grading and feedback for learners. Using Curriculum Studio, their development team saved over a thousand development hours and launched six months earlier than planned using Curriculum Studio to build their learning app. And the uh, last one here is the LA Opera. Uh, since no one can go to the opera due to COVID-19, um, they wanted a way to engage with their community. So they transformed static PDFs into 20 interactive lessons um, that taught students uh, about music, where they can learn about the different pieces of the orchestra uh, and even then have learners record and create their own song from the sounds of the orchestra. Um, oh, one last one, sorry. Uh, the South Carolina, which is a state here in the United States, um, their Department of Education is building a statewide repository of digital curriculum assets. And so they are taking Curriculum Studio and integrating that into their technology stack. Um, so they're offering all of the teachers and um, state with the ability to integrate Curriculum Studio as the primary platform for creating interactive learning experiences. Uh, this has the impact to reach over a quarter of a million students. So the future for Curriculum and the future of kind of what open educational resources looks like to us is um, building the future of learning. So um, it's our vision that uh, with Curriculum Studio, all digital learning experiences become experiential and immersive, blending synchronous and asynchronous at the pace of the learner. Curriculum Studio as a technology can be at the center of that. So things that we're planning on adding to Curriculum Studio over the next three to five years are uh, embedded collaboration. So authors can choose moments to um, have peers collaborate on their work or even push to get connected with a tutor. Um, students can have a portfolio of all of their work created uh, in Curriculum Studio to help with jobs and admissions. Courses can be gamified for 21st century engagement, VR and AR for real world experiences and integrating in STEM lab simulations so they can still have engaging hands-on learning uh, at their fingertips on a device and blend that together with, with online learning. So, um, how to get involved is, you know, check us out on our website, curriculum.org. Uh, again, this is free and open source. So you can easily sign up for the demo environment and try out what it looks like to build interactive learning. Um, because we're free and open source, you know, have your technology team check out our code, at, code on GitHub. The entire software package is free and open source for you to be able to incorporate in um, and, and available on all cloud hosting providers. Um, and please feel free to email me at abby at curriculum.org. We can set up a demo or a discussion about how your organization could use Curriculum Studio. Um, and again, we work with uh, education institutions, uh, publishing companies, and really anybody with something that you want to teach in an interactive and dynamic way. This is, uh, you know, really kind of come out of shifts, 
in learning from, you know, static content and how we can make it dynamic and easy and, and do that through technology. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abby. And well, thank you for a wonderful presentation and a very clear one on the, the work that Karik is being, uh, is being doing at this point. Uh, well, I, I should add that uh, Karik is the leading initiative in OER uh, in, in the US for some years now, uh, uh, well, especially dedicated to K-12. And you have just uh, uh, shown us why. <laughs> we have uh, just a couple of very brief questions that um, it will be very easy for you to reply. First one, um, the, does the, this OER uh, come in other languages than English? And secondly, um, is Kariki using H5, uh, H5P? And which are the advantages to use Kariki instead of H5P? embedded in the, in the LMS. Can I answer those live or type my response? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I can answer. Yes, yes. Do you want me to answer live? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, so yes, we are using H5P for some of our activity types. Um, ultimately, our uh, vision with Curriki Studio is to continue to use H5P where a contributor to their project and actually contribute some XAPI coverage back to H5P for the grade pass back. Um, we are adding additional t activity types outside of just H5P. So things like, um, you know, VR, AR, we've got a Unity kit for gamification. Um, so you'll see a growing library in Curriki Studio. And then the other thing um, to consider ultimately is we've built where we've really focused is the front end interface for authoring. So um, making it really easy for non technologists. Um, you know, and, and really anybody to be able to author content, um, you know, directly uh, in Curriki Studio. So we've really focused on the author experience. Um, so, you know, please continue to use H5P embedded in the LMS. We are, uh, we kind of have one click publishing to any learning management system um, so that you can have a broader distribution besides just the embedded LMS, which I believe is Moodle. Um, so if you're looking for reach across Google Classroom, Canvas, or other institutions, uh, this kind of gives you a create once, publish anywhere. Um, I think the second question was other languages yeah. besides English. Yeah, we are working on it. Um, so uh, it is a browser native platform. So you can use any uh, browser translations for your learners. You can create any content in any language. Cricky Studio as an authoring tool right now is available in English, but we will be uh, adding more languages this year. Thank you, Abby. And now, so we started by having this perspective on uh, the work uh, from Kariki in the US, and now we'll shift to a different kind of experience and uh, the experience of the European School Net. So, Agda, you have the floor now. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking about uh, STEM education and particularly resources on science, technology, engineering and mathematics and on what we've actually been doing during the last year to support teachers uh, with uh, their activities, both with resources and online courses. I'm going to be telling you a bit about what we've learned on the, in the process. So, of course, to start with, we need to understand that the moment that we get up, up from bed every morning, science is all around us. So we go and brush our teeth, we get dressed up. Uh, we might travel to work or we turn on our computers, uh, even when we cook breakfast or even in the evening when we go play or uh, if you go watch sports or just play around, STEM is absolutely everywhere. Now, the problem is that when you go to the classroom, you traditionally, you get the kids inside the classroom, you close the door and it's kind of like a closed environment. It's more like a box where you're separated from the real world. And you have the kids kind of having to learn all this in a way disconnected from this world going around outside. So the teachers have to have to, to share all this content knowledge, all this pedagogy, all the, we, they have different students, they have different uh, areas of expertise. And on top, they have to connect with everything else they have. So subjects, topics, ethics, um, career progression, and now during the last year, they had the extra component on top in case they didn't have enough things to handle was the remote teaching where they suddenly had to interact through a screen uh, with kids of every single age, different capabilities, different interests, and even more different situations at home. 
So where uh, they might have kids where they could have access to a laptop, but there was places where they have different lap uh, one laptop for the whole family. So it was a very, very difficult situation for teachers across the world, which is not finished. So at European SchoolNet, as, as Antonio was explaining before, we, we are a network of ministers of education. So we work with uh, 32 ministers of education across Europe and beyond on how to improve education. And I'm running all the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics projects that we have. So we're talking about 15 to 20, depending on the year. And we have a quite a lot of people connected there. And one of the questions we got during the pandemic, a lot of people were saying like, oh, so you might be more relaxed this year because you know uh, you don't have events or you're not organizing face-to-face -face training. But it actually, we became kind of like, uh, a source of information and knowledge, not only for teachers, but also ministers of education, where they, it was more passive in the past, where we would like, hey, guys, we're doing this, we're turning around and they would go, okay, what do we have now? What can you help us with? So I'm going to show you two examples. But before I go there, I want you to understand one thing. If you want to use something in a classroom, especially uh, across Europe, if you talk to a teacher, I want you to include a new topic in your classroom. The answer they're going to give you is, I can't, it does not fit my curricula. No, I don't have the time. So if you think about curricula, it's kind of like this bookshelf that you see in the background. This is a curricula. It's what tells the teachers what they have to teach. And this curricula depends not only per country, sometimes even per region or age and everything. So if, I, if you tell a teacher, well, now on top of what you're doing, I want you to do this extra thing. It's like trying to put an extra new book in this bookshelf. You need to take something out. And you say, well, I'll just, no, what I'm going to do is just give you a new chapter. Even then the book is a bit thicker. If you're trying to put the book inside the bookshelf, it's not going to fit. So you, we need to understand that there's, these are the constraints we're working on. So if you want to improve education without having to wait for the process of curricula being changed is by enhancing it with adding uh, on top or supplementing the lessons with resources, with training, with anything that helps carry out the teacher do what already they have to do in an easier way or in a more effective way. So we have two initiatives that I wanted to highlight today that have helped during this year. So one, as uh, my colleagues were saying before, uh, uh, before we started this webinar. So of course, we work on scientists, a community for science education. So we've been running this for over 10 years now, 11 years now, 10 years now. So quite a long time. So we've been working on making sure that everything that was happening on STEM education in Europe was in one place. And in particular, the resources, the teaching materials that were created in different projects were included in one repository. So when the project's finished, you would still find there. Now you have to understand one thing that has actually been very interesting. During those 10, 11 years, what's happened is from the beginning, we had to go and look for the resources, okay? And, but in the last few years, we don't actually look for them. They come to us. They already know that it exists. But as I was saying before, before we were more like kind of pushing our content out, during the last year, it was it, the things really turned around where we would get people that would not, normally not pay attention to online teaching go, can I have these type of resources? We had ministers of education contacting us. I know you were talking to me for three years about remote uh, labs. Um, I kind of wasn't listening. Um, what did you have exactly again? Because now we have to problem. Now we actually have to look for it. So it's very important to understand that you are going, when you work with open education resources, you're, you might be preparing things that are not useful yet, but if you don't start working now, by the time they actually need it, it's too late. If, if repositories like Scientix or even the click that was, uh, Abby was mentioning before, if they didn't exist, if they didn't start working five, 10 years ago, they would not have been there last year when they were really needed. And by then it was very late to actually implement many things that were required. The second thing I want to talk about is uh, comes from the lessons learned from another pilot that we were running last year on integrating nature-based solutions into the classroom. So we're talking about solutions that uh, improve society that use nature instead of um, artificial materials. So, for example, instead of uh, actually, if, if you go to the street and they're they're creating a wall between two lanes, so instead of just putting concrete, then you put like trees, and you're actually still achieving the same result, but 
helping nature and, and making it in a more uh, eco-friendly way. So we had a project on creating learning scenarios for the integration or the use of nature-based solutions in classrooms. So that project started like a month and a half before the pandemic hit. So of course, we already knew we we're gonna create learning scenarios. They were gonna be in English, uh, they were gonna be translated, they were gonna be modular, adaptable, expandable. So, you know, pretty much everything we knew we, learning scenarios should, should be. And I'll tell you a bit more in a second how that imp got impacted by the pandemic. So going into the lessons learned, as I was saying before, thanks to the fact of those portals or resources existing or repositories existing, we you were able to already help. So as a message to anybody working on, on educational resources, you kind of have to think about it before the need. So if you're already thinking, oh, they really need it now, it's a bit too late. So think about uh, licenses of the materials. Are they going to be adaptable? Are they going to be able to translate it, as Abby was saying, that you actually are making sure that this resource can actually be used by anybody or they can actually be integrated in different aspects. So what, that's one of the things that we realized again, that, okay, at some point where you felt, oh, why am I doing this? Uh, nobody's using it right now. It actually serves a purpose and it is ready by the time it's needed. The second thing is, of course, uh, the adaptability that we were mentioning before. In the learning scenarios, we actually realized as well that in spite of everything, teachers are amazing. They're very resilient. They really figure things out. So within a few weeks, we had to tell them, okay, all this work you've done on the creating these wonderful learning scenarios, go back and make them, that you're able to use them through remote teaching. So you're no longer in the classroom, but you still have to teach this. How do you adapt it? So the, the, those amazing authors, teachers were actually went back and went, okay, if I move this and I turn it around, but they had to get, make it so, so adaptable. That is not only that it's gonna be with different types of kids, different subjects, different ages, uh, different cultures. Now they had to do the case where you have no students in the classroom, the case where you have some students, but others not, the case where you have a student connecting but they're by themselves, a student connected, but the parents is behind, behind them. So these learning scenarios and these, learn, these teachers learned how to well adapt it to remote teaching, intervention of parents uh, where they were there, uh, activities across different time zones. So they really became essential, both the fact that the materials were already open, but that the teachers knew how to expand and were ready to really adapt it uh, like that. Then we also have, uh, of course, an experience connected also with this project is that online training, many, teach many people were saying, well, people, teachers are very busy now with the whole teaching, so they're gonna be pulling away from uh, training. In fact, we've seen the opposite. We've seen a huge rise on, on participation of teachers on online training. So they realized, uh, even those that had never participated before, they realized they really had to be there. So. For example, this uh, online MOOC that we run this year, the beginning of this year, we had over 1,200 teachers actually taking per, uh, part of the MOOC and learning uh, how to adapt it, how could they use it, and how and they realized they had to connect their classes to real situations, real cases. And nature-based solutions gave them a very good excuse to do that. Uh, and also connected to that, uh, we also, of course, have the STEM discovery campaign that we've just launched. And even if they're working from home, there's also still this need of the connectivity, of connecting from different angles, how to make sure that what you're doing, even if you're not connected in the classroom with students, how you're connected to everybody else. So we do have this campaign where we have teachers already about over 700 teachers have already been sharing all their actions they're doing on STEM education either in isolation or with the students, with communities, everything like that. So I just want to say, finish saying that it was the proactivity and being ready beforehand, uh, where you could see that teachers, uh, where you could see that well, all your efforts were had to be ready for when they're needed, not create them when they're needed. And one of the examples uh, I was mentioning before, going back to the ministry, was about this remote um, experiments, for example. So I know uh, my colleague Sophocles later on is going to be talking about it as well on hands-on experiments. So that's something that was really like, oh no, now, okay, fine, we have the resources. How do we actually do the experiments as well when you have remote teaching? And finally, make sure that uh, you understand that teachers are amazing and they can really adapt and, and use anything they want and just make sure that they're not working alone through campaigns or any way that you can connect them.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agda. Uh, a wonderful presentation, another one. <laughs> it will be a, 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 an endless <laughs> number of uh, extra, uh, excellent presentations. Thank you very much, Agda, for pointing out a, n a number of very important uh, aspects. I will just uh, ask you if uh, we don't have questions from uh, the participants at this stage, but uh, do you have actual figures on the increase uh, of uh, OER use from your, from your case? So we don't have the number of, of uh, increased use of the actual resources. What we have noticed is the so far on the training, uh, yes, and all the and all the materials uh, used. And I can also tell you of the importance of actually being a representative. So, for example, in scientists, we have scientists ambassadors, which are these teachers that represent and connect and share the information. And under normal circumstances, we would have get, got about I don't know 800 applications. So we had almost uh, I think it was like. 1,500 teachers from across Europe that said, okay, no, I really want to be there and help others on how to access all that. And uh, as a small announcement, like uh, it's still not public completely, but so you just so you know, there's actually uh, 400 more ambassadors that have passed all the levels. And from now we actually have 800 teachers across Europe that are official scientists ambassadors, and they're going to be helping other teachers on the use on, uh, of of, uh, of the resources, the training, and how to implement teaching, uh, not only face to face, but in remote uh, settings. Well, Agda, we have a, a short qu uh, question from Mirka. Uh, who can attend the Moodle courses offered on, offered on Scientix web? So the massive open online courses at the European School Net Academy, they're open to absolutely anybody in, in the world. And we have teachers from everywhere, uh, yeah, pretty much everywhere uh, across the world. Even the scientists ambassador, we have now teachers, representatives in, in India, we have several. We have uh, ambassadors in several countries in South America. We have one in the States. Uh, we have, uh, I was seeing before in the Philippines. So everything we do is completely open, Creative Commons. You can have actually even grab the MOOC, uh, take pieces of them, translate them, using them in their, your own platforms. You can take them to Kuriki if you want to, and you can embed it wherever you want. Well, uh, Alfredo, is also, Alfredo Suero, also an Eden fellow, is, um, is asking you if uh, these materials from those, uh, school net, the European School Net can be also used, uh, or if you have, of course, evidence of that can also be used in uh, higher education, for instance, or other sectors. So higher education, we don't have much experience. So we concentrate on primary, secondary. So that means four years old to 21, depending on the country. What we do know is that it's being used uh, in teacher training. So in, in higher education, with, when they teach future teachers. So that, yes. Yeah. But uh, but we at higher education, I'll tell you in a different direction. We have a number of materials and research that we created for secondary education. And we, it turns out that teachers were, had been able to adapt it to pre-primary. So they were using things that we thought, okay, this is for 16 years old, and they found a way they could still use it with three years old. So my guess is that then it can go in the opposite direction as well. well thank you, Akta. Well, there is also a, a question here related to translation, but you had already uh, <laughs> replied to that, uh, explaining that the, these materials have been translated to several languages. Well, thank you, Akta. We have uh, seen now, uh, I mean, we have... Um, um, uh, had now uh, two uh, perspectives from uh, OER from the OER production um, uh, in in a sense, and we will now shift to uh, a, a different kind of perspective. What is the input from research and the research that actually is uh, giving an input to policy making? The policy making that is also supporting. Uh, uh, the European School Net, so th this completes a kind of a circle. And so, uh, um, Andrea, what is your perspective uh, uh, from these on these experiences, and especially what has been your experience from uh, this uh, this pandemic uh, uh, context? <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for this brief introduction, Antonio. Uh, good afternoon, um, good morning or good evening uh, to you all participating. Greetings to my fellow uh, panel members. It's a pleasure to be here participating in this Open Education Week uh, event organized by Eden. And indeed, I will share with you exactly what Antonio said now, a little bit of the European perspective on, on the policy making and our research and how this is trans translated not only into policy, but actually into tools that uh, have been used um, all over Europe and beyond. So I'll share my screen with you.
Yes, Andrea, it's perfect. Brilliant. Okay, thank you for, for confirming. Um, so, um, as has been said by colleagues in the panel before, uh, COVID has really posed us um, many challenges in education, you know? uh, not only for schools, for teachers, uh, but also for the students and families and parents. Um, we know that there has been a, a quick response uh, uh, to the COVID by schools, um, increasing also the access and on, on the search for open educational resources and, and MOOCs and open online courses. But the immediate response that we saw was an increase in remote learning and quite often um, transposing or changing uh, what had been doing uh, on face-to-face -face education, taking it into the online domain. You know? And what we realized uh, in this uh, new way of, of learning for many people is that um, although we considered that young students, you know, the young generation, were digital natives, uh, research has already shown to us that not all of them are actually prepared for studying online and not all of them are actually digitally competent for studying online. We know that studying online requires um, a number of skills, no, or using the digital and digital technologies for studying uh, requires some skills. And, and that is organization, it is um, being able to understand what could be fake news, it is self-regulation, so and so forth. So that um, was something that we already knew before the pandemics, but during the pandemics, that's an, an, another data that has become very transparent and visible to us educators. Now, the same question can be asked in, with respect to the teachers. You know. Are teachers, are they actually equipped to respond to this challenging of uh, uh, suddenly having to uh, teach online or use digital technologies for their teaching? Um, we that belong to Eden and that are educators in the area, in the field of distance learning, have been working uh, with this for many, many years, decades, no, perhaps. But for many teachers, this was something new. No, So we know that there is limited preparation and support available for teachers nowadays that could enable them to make a smooth transition to the digital uh, world, to online teaching. And we realized that um, ICT skills for teaching staff was something that we really needed to, needed to cater for because there was this huge gap uh, um, in knowing how to use not only technologies for teaching because teaching, you no know, co-facilitating learning, you know, um, co-learning is not only about using technologies, but above all, to understand the learning theories behind the teaching methods that we use. No, and once we, we know the learning theories and we know all the methodologies available, uh, preferably active methodologies no, for teaching, then we can perhaps to choose the best technologies to be used. So using technology as a medium, not as the end of, of teaching online, you know, not as the, the only um, destination for teaching online. So we realized there was a huge gap in that and a really need for more uh, uh, teacher training in that sense. So some research there also before the pandemics shows to us that um, 56% of students in Europe had received the training uh, on using digital technologies for teaching. And out of these uh, 56%, 43% felt that they were well equipped, you know, to teach uh, using digital technologies online. But what about the rest? You know, there are many teachers that have never actually had proper training on using digital technology. So why am I talking about digital technologies if we are talking about OER? Because I really want to make this... Um, um, this call for the need of digital competences so that teachers can uh, make the best use of what open educational resources can offer to us, the education community. No? Um, by knowing more about how to use digital technologies, teachers and students can not only find OER, but also create and share open educational resources. Right. So this is the lens that we are taking. First of all, we're starting with um, awareness raising about uh, the need for more training for digital technology 
technologists, and then introducing uh, OER within the tools that we are building, which I'm going to show you in a minute, in a way to make teachers more aware that these things, these two things come hand in hand. Uh, not to say that OER obviously is not only about uh, um, digitally created resources, we can have also OER based on printed materials, but the idea here is really to showcase the need for uh, digital competence of teachers going hand in hand with uh, the creation and use of OER, okay? So how do we European Commission respond to it? As many of you know, we've had uh, in 2018 a communication on the Digital Education Action Plan, which has now been revisited just during the pandemics uh, in 2021. And now we have a new, a new plan, which is called DEAP2, the, the new Digital Education Plan for the European Commission 2021 and 2027. And the, one of the main priorities of this Digital Education Action Plan in the Commission is to foster the digital competence of educators. So um, I think that most of you know the GCompedu framework, a framework that was uh, first published in 2017. So we've been talking about it for a long time now. Um, it's a framework that showcases six areas in which um, educators uh, should be digitally competent. You know? And it's, as you can see, much, much more, um, it's going much more uh, beyond technology use. It's really about about um, how to be competent in communication, as you can see in area one, communicating with their community, their imme immediate community and colleagues and beyond, um, building networks for collaboration, how to use digital resources. And this is exactly where um, I would place open educational resources in this framework, uh, because as you will see in a moment, um, we talk about the use of licenses, right? So teaching and training, assessment, how do we assess online? It, it, it was uh, also something else that many teachers had to learn. And also, also very important, as previously uh, said uh, in the beginning of my presentation, the need for empowering learners and also teachers in the role of facilitating the learner's digital competence. So if you zoom into this framework now, uh, I would place OER in area two when we talk about creating, selecting, creating, and modifying resources, right? Although not very explicit on this, on this tube map, let's say, on this roadmap, this is where we place open educational resources in there. So when the teacher um, uses this decompedu de framework, they can have a level of um of expertise described within the six areas from A1 to C2. And um, they can do that by using the check-in tool. Currently, we have available for everyone in the world, not only for Europeans, the check-in tool, you can see the URL in there, which based in this uh, framework, which I've just shown, um, every teacher can uh, do a self-assessment, a self-reflection on their own competences, on their own digital competences, uh, on those six areas that I've Shown. And towards the end of the self-assessment, there is a report automatically produced for this teacher, right? And this should be, the idea is that this should be used to help the teacher plan their own um, um, uh, professional, continuous professional development uh, from them on, whether they are looking for open courses, MOOCs, etc., and also to help their institution to plan for their training needs, okay? So that's how it's being used. Um, in terms of the checking tool, it's, it's important to say that it can be, uh, and, and Decompedu can be used for uh, both higher education and school education for all levels of education. And that now uh, we have been having uh, a, an experience with Spain, just to give us an example for higher education, in which um, we have included in this checking tool, which is based on the Decompedu framework, all these statements for self-reflection are based on those areas. We have explicitly included a section on the open edu framework, which is the European framework for uh, open education, in order for teachers to um, be able to reflect upon their practices on open science, open teaching, accessibility, etc. So our goal, although it seems really embedded, you no, know, embedded into, into the tool, was really by promoting self-reflection to enable uh, teachers to become more aware of the role that open educational resources have to play uh, in creating, producing, finding, and sharing resources. 
So what is next, just to finalize, it's a new tool that we are putting together called Selfie for Teachers uh, that we plan to launch in September 2019, which is a new version of the checking tool focusing on school education. Uh, for higher education, we remain using uh, the checking for the moment. And I invite everyone to join the GCompreDu community. If you search online for GCompreDu community, uh, you'll find it. It's an open community for everyone to exchange information on digital competence and open education. Thanks okay. for the moment. Thank you very much, Andrea. Well, another excellent presentation, as we were expecting. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for pointing out also a, a number of important aspects that, uh, well, most most of them related to uh, the the role of teacher and how teachers are prepared to uh, uh, to use OER and are prepared to in, to in, in, engage in an open educational culture as well. Do you have, um, we, we don't have um, uh, other questions at this, uh, this stage from, um, from the participants, but I would just ask you, do you have uh, uh, clear indicators at this point on the increase in terms of uh, uh, this awareness from the part of, the, of teachers? Uh, awareness of the OER. Well, I can I can give you some numbers of the open educational culture. What it implies. Um, I mean, as a result of, of the development of this uh, competence framework. Yeah. Okay. Good question, Antonio. Because um, you see, we have done lots of research specifically on open education and OER in the past, and now because of this need to increase digital competence, we are focusing more on on producing this tool and and on reframing those questions in the framework because these questions have been revisited now. But uh, by embedding by embedding OER in there, we are hoping that this awareness raising will take place. You now, this is on our way to help awareness raising in OER. Um, but I can give you some numbers. I think that overall, we have more than 250,000 people uh, using this tool. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's quite a big number. Um, and we plan to increase it even more as soon as we launch in September the new version of this tool. So we have countries not only in Europe working with it and ministries of education as well. Many ministries of education are asking uh, their teachers to, to, to go through the self-reflection, but also countries in Latin America, more than nine countries in Latin America have been using this tool for awareness raising. Thank you very much, Andrea. Now, uh, um it, it's time to go to another part of the problem, uh, the center of the problem, which is which are teachers, of course. And I would uh, give the floor to uh, to Sophocles uh, to, for him to give his pers uh, his um, his perspective and and bring, of course, uh, bring us back the discussion to to its center, to teachers. Sophocles, you have the floor. Antonio, thank you very much for uh, this uh, invitation. Um, I would, uh, let's say, start by uh, wishing to you and to Eden happy anniversary. I'm uh, following the journey of uh, Eden the last uh, 22 years, and uh, I, I trust that uh, you are really uh, serving in the best way the modernization of education. And uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, many things that we are developing together all these years, they are now, due to the pandemic, they are coming to, to real action. So uh, my, uh, my uh, presentation is going to focus on a rather, uh, let's say, specific um, issue that uh, has to do with uh, uh, science education and especially the introduction of inquiry uh, learning uh, during the time of the pandemic. The, especially the experimental process has a central role in the inquiry approach. There are uh, very important benefits for that. So uh, we cannot really uh, just replace the, um, uh, the, the experimental work, uh, the lab work with uh, uh, let me say Zoom or a WebEx uh, classroom. So uh, in, in principle, we have really to make use uh, of all the, uh, of the tools uh, we have in order to uh, keep the, the, process, uh, the process running. So uh, here I'm going to present uh, a series of uh, findings 
um, that uh, we had the chance to explore uh, during the school's uh, closure uh, one, one year ago. Uh, we, have, we had in one night to turn the operation of a whole school involving more than uh, 2,000 uh, students uh, online and try to keep uh, delivering high quality uh, services. And uh, we came up that uh, all these restrictions at uh, the end of the day, they have uh, offered us uh, unique opportunities because uh, we were more autonomous. There were uh, flexible solutions and tools uh, that uh, everyone had uh, really the opportunity to, to select and test. Uh, we have seen a significant use of uh, open educational resources. Uh, I, I would like to highlight the, that uh, it was really very important, all this uh, community building process where uh, teachers were uh, really supporting uh, one, one the other. And uh, as I said, we had uh, uh, the chance to see numerous innovations from the last years, from the work, uh, you know, we are making in uh, small scale experiments uh, to uh, really take up. And um, I believe that um, with the appropriate use of uh, resources and tools, uh, we had the opportunity to highlight the importance of personalized learning. Uh, somehow the participation of all and the contribution of all students was really necessary. And at the same time, thanks to a series of tools, the teachers have the chance to monitor the students' activities during the uh, experimentation. Um, the most crucial parameters that we had to, st to study very carefully during uh, this exercise um, was to make sure that we are keeping the interest and the motivation of the students at high levels and we are still enhancing the problem-solving uh, competence of uh, the students. I'm going to present very quickly some uh, examples of uh, tools and resources that have been used uh, at different levels of uh, school, at uh, different, uh, let's say, different time duration in the framework of uh, normal lessons or uh, project uh, or project work. I will discuss the remote labs and virtual labs. Uh, some of, in some cases enriched with uh, augmented reality applications that are uh, offering a really um, a great tool for teachers to to, to describe the let's say the um, invisible uh, scientific phenomena. Use of resources from data archives, from, from science centers, museums, from research centers, and also virtual visits to research uh, infrastructures. So, from one side, there are numerous experiments, remote ones or virtual ones, that can really uh, replace the experimentation in the, in the school lab. And uh, there is also a significant uh, benefit here that every student is able to perform the experiment, something that it is not really happening in the, in the school lab where usually there is the demonstration and the students are following. Here, uh, uh, somehow due to the, um, uh, to the pandemic, every student had to perform the experiment to get involved with the activity, to collect data, to set the parameters and so on. And I believe that this was a, a, a benefit uh, in the overall process. As I said, uh, the use of augmentation, of, of augmented reality uh, um, was also a tool to present um, the, the, the phenomena and to support, let's say, the, the conceptual change for, for students. Other animations, you know, coming from different uh, fields uh, were deployed in order to support students' uh, work, always connected with the, with the school curriculum, even uh, game-based uh, uh, platforms that are um, uh, helping students to design and develop their projects, like to develop and run um, a, wind, uh, a wind farm and uh, check out the the operation, the uh, 
uh, power and power production and uh, and uh, so on. Also, resources from uh, science centers and museums, unique resources, for example, from Galileo Museum that is presenting a series of uh, 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 discoveries of Galileo that can be used uh, in mathematics, in uh, in uh, in physics uh, lessons, for example, the rotation of a uh, of uh, of the sun can be used uh, as part of the um, circular motion uh, lessons in the in the school uh, in the school curriculum. Uh, also, access to uh, scientific resources like uh, uh, Soho uh, Observatory that is following the sun, uh, and together with the resources from the science center that I have presented uh, before can give a, a, rich, a rich experience to the students of the whole uh, history, history of science. And of course, these are just of some, uh, some examples that uh, we have implemented in the framework of, this, uh, of these activities. Uh, here, uh, I would like to, to highlight, um, apart from the digital content and the real added value of digital resources, the importance of the of the uh, support that uh, schools have received uh, from uh, outreach groups and uh, research groups of uh, uh, major research infrastructures that uh, they have offered access to scientific data uh, for students to perform experiments. One case are the uh, seismic data, uh, and maybe you know that this period, apart from the pandemic in Greece, we are experiencing very strong uh, earthquakes in the central area of, uh, of, of the country. And this data, thanks to a big uh, network of uh, seismometers that are installed in schools, can be always available to everyone to uh, perform, uh, let's say, uh, to, to design lessons that are connected not only with geology or, uh, uh, let's say, uh, earthquake activity, but also related to the tomography of, of Earth, uh, receiving signals. Here, this, uh, this image is uh, from uh, yesterday night. The, um, the, the blue and the red uh, big, uh, let's say, waveforms uh, demonstrate the two earthquakes that uh, uh, hit uh, central Greece, and uh, in between the small ones are coming, in fact, from the other side of the planet, from the big earthquake in uh, New Zealand. So these uh, waves have crossed the center of the Earth and they have um, uh, were monitored from the uh, seismometers that are installed in these uh, in these schools. Another another case was uh, virtual visits. You know, it's not only important the schools to move to the to the um, digital, let's say, version of schooling, but also other players who are uh, really very important to contribute to school education to also uh, adapt to the new to the new reality. And here I would like to mention the emblematic uh, figures of uh, Michael Hoch and uh, Mick Store, I know that they are following this, uh, um, this event today and I would like to thank them because they were always there for students when the, they were visiting uh, CERN, but also uh, during the pandemic, they were all, always ready to share their experience, their knowledge and uh, organize virtual visits for numerous schools across Europe, not only for our school, but also for numerous, uh, numerous schools uh, sharing their work and uh, findings. So uh, concerning the, the, the use, there was a, a significant upgrade to uh, the usage of the, of the platforms, the usage of uh, resources. We had uh, uh, almost all the school uh, moving online, so uh, clearly, the analytics are increased, but uh, uh, the, the, the issue was that uh, we had the opportunity really to see uh, the distribution, let's say, um, 
of the activity during the time that was also expanding in the afternoon hours when the, uh, the students were using the platforms and the tools uh, during the preparation of the, of the lesson. So this graph demonstrates a, a week from Sunday to Saturday, and you can see with uh, a dark blue uh, color the, the main time of the activity from the, uh, from the, school, uh, from the school platform. But also additional uh, data demonstrating the uh, session duration, the lessons duration, because this is also connected with, uh, uh, let's say, the quality of the service that we are offering to the students. We had about a mean of uh, 45 minutes, very close to the normal uh, school, uh, school hour, uh, measuring the starting, the, the, the number of students who were there the moment that the lesson was starting or when the lesson was uh, was ending again we had a very uh, significant numbers in uh, uh, the participation and also the delivery of the uh, homework of the projects or the findings from the uh, from the experiments that were always uh, let's say in the majority of the times before the the deadline uh, measuring the interest and motivation of students was for us a very important uh, aspect. So we have monitored this uh, during the whole um, the whole period, and we have seen that we have managed, the, uh, thanks to all these activities, to keep the interest and motivation of students high. And uh, also, they were very much interested in the preparation of the experiments that they had to present in the class because this was the task the 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 task of the presentation of the experiment was allocated always to to students uh, to students uh, groups and uh, we had also data from uh, assessing the problem solving competence as i said the the fact that all students were using the platform gave the opportunity to monitor the whole process during the inquiry cycle also during the performance of the experiment so this is offering us uh, unique data that are uh, helping us to uh, assess the partial abilities that are developing the problem uh, solving competence, which is a major, let's say, issue when we are implementing um, inquiry based approaches. So uh, lessons learned, we have seen that uh, the use, the massive use of these tools can help teachers to implement inquiry over distance. Uh, we have uh, seen a unique pool of OERs being uh, used. Um, they are keeping the interest and the motivation of students at high levels. Uh, it's a, a good uh, opportunity also for teachers to monitor the students' ex experimental work effectively because all the students are performing the experiments um, in this distance learning environment um, the there is the chance for every student to be involved in the experiment not the uh, only one or two when they are making the demonstration in uh, the class and i think um, this is a strong message to revisit the policy as far as the use of open educational resources in education is concerned, and to bring back this uh, idea of open education, open content, open pedagogy, and open collaboration, which is restricted even uh, when we, we don't have, let's say, uh, the difficulties we are facing now with the pa pandemic. So we have to look um, to all these findings and uh, rethink, I believe, uh, uh, science education after this, um, this uh, crisis. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's uh, all from my side. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to hear comments or questions. Thank you very much, Sophocles, and congratulations, because this is a one, uh, an extraordinary work that you've just presented. Uh, it's it's very um, interesting, um, these, um, well, your conclusions, but also the fact that during the 
the presentation, it became clear this connection that you actually managed to increase between uh, op uh, open educational practices in a sense, and also uh, open science, and I would say even citizen science in, in, in some way. So the increase in the levels of participation by the students and possibly even the families, you, you can comment on that. Uh, it, it's quite, uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting um, and, and, and significant. Also the fact that uh, this collaboration with uh, uh, science institutions, I mean, especially with non-formal education institutions as museums, uh, laboratory labs, and all of these other uh, research institutions that could, that are also producing uh, resources that can be used in, in educational contexts. And this is really uh, uh, amazing because it well it, it's it's a, a clear evidence of something that we've been discussing for many years, but we haven't seen uh, as clear evidence as this. So my question to you at this point would be: um, Do you also find Sophocles uh, evidences of um, improvement in terms of student performance, given this um, increased participation and this increased involvement? in the scientific pro scientific process. And let me just add a comment that uh, congratulations, congratulations to you as well for the 30th anniversary of Eden because you have been a very important contributor to that success. <laughs> um, uh, let me say, Antonio, the, uh, the fact is that uh, our um, uh, experiment uh, took place uh, mainly, let's say, um, to a specific period of uh, three months when the schools were closed. Uh, then uh, students came, uh, came back to school and uh, also the, the, final, the final exam um, was um, organized uh, following the traditional, uh, the traditional way. So I, I, I can say that uh, we didn't have the, the chance really to, to perform the experiment that uh, um, long, very long, uh, very long period. Uh, uh, our um, aim was uh, really to see if we can uh, keep the interest and motivation high. Uh, as far as the problem competence, uh, problem solving competence for me, it's a major educational, uh, major educational outcome. Uh, but. Uh, as the uh, system for the exams at the end remains at the traditional level, uh, we cannot really uh, uh, monitor or uh, see any uh, impact or or no uh, uh, about uh, about uh, about that. Uh, the fact is that um, uh, the students perform. Uh, very well. Also, the students at the final exams, the national exams of the school perform very well. So we can at least say that uh, we have still managed to deliver a service at the quality of uh, education, uh, the traditional the traditional education by moving all these uh, aspects to the, to the digital world. Thank you very much, Sophocles. Now to, um, uh, well, to conclude this, um, this cycle, uh, I, I'm going to call um, Tell to, to share his uh, view as well on the on this topic um let me also add that uh um, tell represents also a kind of a circle of the world because if we have um colleagues uh abby uh well she's early in the morning in the in the united states uh, well the same with tell in brazil we have uh, sophocles in greece um agatha in in uh, in belgium i guess and uh andre in spain and we have also people following us uh, in the in the Far East, so you can have a quite a, a good understanding of what is the outreach of Eden with just this uh, uh, this tour of the world. Um, Tell uh, you have a, a lot of experience in actually um, following up and, and supporting teachers uh, using um, OER in schools. Uh, how was how how did it change? Uh, due to the pandemic. Well, Tal, you have the floor. All right, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question by looking at uh, one of the things that we're particularly interested in and uh, curious about during this period and has been this idea of uh, what we're calling the Education Under Vigilance project that we've been doing for quite a while. 
Uh, and it's, it's gotten to the center of our attention because we think it's been kind of an underrated discussion around the idea of openness. Uh, uh, people are very eager, and I think people in our community and people that are interested in, in distance education and open education are very eager to promote uh, this this movement towards uh, the the use of these technologies. And sometimes we're um, we're not quite aware, I think, and not quite uh, clear on the message that we send in regards to what kind of infrastructures and and technologies that we use. And this is something that we've been focused on as. Uh, as a project during this this moment of great openness, but at the same time, some very uh, very difficult decisions that have to be made in terms of how we we make this openness happen. And so, I'd like to present that for a little little time that I have here. Uh, so, uh, I think it, we're very much aware of of this movement to online environments. We've all talked about this, and we've gotten used to it. I think a bit over this past year. Even though we all promote, you know, distance education and open education, this is quite new uh, for all of us uh, in, in in the speed that it happened and the way that it happened. And it didn't it didn't occur just to us that this speed and and this movement, uh, you know, that caught us in shock, uh, could be used for for uh, educational purposes. It also can be used for very very strong marketing and economic purposes. And so, this uh, this little slide from the Guardian says something that. You see the benefit of of this this learning, but you also see an opportunity of privatization of of public education and an increased movement of some businesses towards uh, the online and the open environment. I have this this quite beautiful phrase from the director of education from Google in Brazil that says, uh, "One of the advantages of offering services to schools is that you build loyalty early on." And uh, this is something that I used to say uh, that that was a problem. Uh, in regards to these platforms as they, they join educational systems. And it was kind of a shock to me to see this spoken so openly. Uh, and it should alert us that um, any business uh, that's based on the fidelity of your kids, uh, you can think of other businesses that do the same business model, um, would, wouldn't cause an alert to us, wouldn't cause us to, to kind, of, kind of a scare to us in regards to what's happening in education today. And I won't have time to talk about a lot of these issues but uh, I want to just kind of give you a sense of what the things that we are worried about. And there are many more. And some of these, of course, you are well aware of. Others might be something that you, you haven't thought about before. But uh, I, what we encourage people to think is the intersection of what we push for in terms of open education, what we want in terms of open education, and how it intersects with how, what these businesses and what's happening in terms of a movement towards these businesses. And, and what I mean is... Uh, the great proliferation of platforms like Google Suite for Education or Microsoft 365 that have kind of dominated the market in this area. And I'll present you with some data on that in just a bit. Uh, some of the worries that we have in, in this GAFA model, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft has been called, and some place it's called GAFA without the Microsoft at the end. We very surely want to include Microsoft here. Uh, is, is that we all know that I think it's been hammered into our heads through movies and news that collection analysis of data and metadata is a business model. Whether it's used for advertising, whether it's used for promotion of their own products, uh, these massively complex services that are offered to schools around the world uh, is not something that's been given for free. Even though it's pitched as free, it's just an exchange for a massive amounts of data. And as we see that, uh, a, a play for fidelity on, on, on kids' minds. We know that there's a huge problem with feeding algorithms and fake news. That's been abundantly clear in our political systems. And we, again, have seen movies on, on this uh, in, in Netflix and in other, in other platforms that talk about the problems with, with how, how we feed and the uh, opacity of algorithms. And the same thing happens within the educational systems when they adopt these platforms. Uh, the, the issue of loyalty I've just mentioned from that quote. Uh, we have a big problem in, in reducing service options. Uh, once you lock into a, a service like this, and in the pandemic, many school systems, many universities have locked into systems like this. And when you migrate, as we all know, when you change a provider for distance education or remote education, uh, this becomes a huge, huge lock-in problem. It's very hard to move from one to the other. And they they don't encourage you to do that. I mean, you, 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 you put all your data, you make all your accounts, uh, you, you integrate everything within these systems and you end up teaching your own faculty and, and students to use these systems. That becomes a problem. Uh, we have all sorts of issues with, 
with what's now being called algorithmic prejudice and content removal from these platforms. So once we we encourage to use, say, Google Suite for Education, we're also encouraged to use YouTube. We're also encouraged to use their own platforms to publish our content. And that leads to things that are not educational uh, in, in their uh, in their essence, and it integrates within the educational offerings. And so there, there are a lot of other issues that I could talk about, and I want to skip some of that because I'm, I'm sure you're aware of these. Um, but this concentration of power into, into basically two big platforms has become a really big issue for, for education and for us in, in, in open. And we see quite often people that are very strong advocates of open education saying things like, well, create a Google Classroom uh, or create a Google page, or you can create your own course uh, at Google. And we, we often don't see the incongruity between these two things. And we want to encourage schools and universities to join these platforms. It becomes a big issue. And so since 2018, we've been kind of mapping this information. Uh, and we we have a project that's called in Portuguese Educação Vigiada, which is we're translating as education under vigilance. Uh, and we've mapped the data uh, on through an automatic script. It's an open script, of course, it's published on GitLab. You're welcome to take a look. And what we do is we map how public higher education, school, state systems, and municipalities uh, are, are um, adhering to these systems. Are they contracting these systems? Are they entering into agreements with particularly Google and Microsoft, which are the biggest players in our region? And we verify this data through freedom of information requests or lie, as they're called in Brazil. Uh, we, we verify this information and we have a, a pretty consistent map of what happens in Brazil uh, over the past couple of years. And we've been tracking this information. Uh, no surprise, it's been going incredibly. And if we look at uh, the data that we have now, this is very recent. We just pushed it to the site a little while ago. It shows us that if you look at all public institutions in Brazil for higher education, which are over 120, you look at all uh, state systems, 27 systems, which are in, in charge of, of basically secondary level basic education. And then you look at all cities with over 500,000 inhabitants, 66% already have an agreement of some sort with Microsoft or Google in Brazil. If you take out the municipalities, the number goes to 75% which is an incredible number of, of students that are involved already within these systems. And this number has grown substantially during the pandemic, which uh, in this emergency moment, people are, are flocking to these systems because they are free offerings and they didn't have time to find alternatives. Uh, we're just finalizing the expansion of this data to all of South America. The data is going to start to be published this week. And by the end of the, the month of March, we'll have all data collected already. But you can see that in, in other countries, the situation is even more dire. So in Colombia, we have now that in higher education institutions, 95% of them are already associated with both Google uh, or Microsoft. And this is a trend. And the reason we worry about it is because uh, if you look at a national survey that's done every year in Brazil on uh, technology and education, you can see that uh, most students have, for example, a profile or an account in WhatsApp or Facebook, which are the same company, obviously. And uh, a very large number of, of students report using this for school. So in case of WhatsApp, for example, it's 61%. And so we're encouraging students to join these platforms where the school systems are bringing in these platforms. And we're kind of locking ourselves in into a place like this while we're talking about being open. And so uh, in order to change the tone from very uh, drastic and very hard times, what we've been trying to do uh, in, in partnership with UNESCO here in Brazil is to try to uh, create a new, new set of a new mentality around the world of open, which includes the idea of, of digital rights as part of what open education might mean. And so we started this year and we have our first cohort finishing this month, a course that we're calling open education leader. And it's supposed to be purposely a contrast to something like a Google educator. And in this course, not only do we talk about open educational resource competencies, but we also discuss things like open tools, open source, and what does it mean to have privacy, digital rights, access to information, and so forth. So we want to embed this idea that, uh, that open education is not just about uh, you know, learning and using open licenses, which is a very important thing to do, but also the sort of tools and the ecosystem around this uh, is very important. So this is our first cohort. We have two more this uh, this this year in 2021, uh, and I think it's a it's a, an interesting initiative to get educators on board. 
As part of this, in order to support the course, we started a project that's called uh, Escolha Livre, and these materials are, of course, on Portuguese. They've been launched in the past three or four months, which is sort of a, a guide for, for, for teachers about open source software and open educational resources, you know, where to find them, how to use them. But it's really focused on the idea in the moment that we're in of the pandemic. So it says, so you want to do a video conference. This is places where you can do it freely, and here are the advantages of doing it. And here are some teachers talking about this. You want to do collaborative writing, you know, you never thought about doing collaborative writing. This is where you can do it freely, and this is how, where you can do it safely, uh, not not looking at the platforms that are necessarily imposed on you by by government or by your institution. So it's a, a free guide to talk about these issues. In all, in order to help uh, you know public managers, the people that contract these things, we we started a project. This is the last one. It's been uh, it's just been launched a, a little while ago, which is a map of providers. So. Uh, we, we have some uh, some information now in the next couple of months, we'll have a lot more uh, that basically tries to tie uh, businesses and providers that work with open source and open educational resources with people that want to hire them. So, you know, public institutions, governments uh, in, in regional places uh, that, that they'll be able to find who they can hire to you know, install a Moodle instance or a Rocket Chat instance or, or a Jitsi server or a big blue button server or whatever it might be. So putting these people together has been a big challenge because this is a very fragmented market. And finally, uh, we did a little testing of our own. And so when, 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 uh, when, when teachers come to our course and they, they learn about these tools, one of the things that we do is say we encourage them to try these things out. And so we did our own little server that has basically three, I think, very useful tools. Uh, a Jitsi instance, which is a video conference instance, a Mumble instance, which is for audio chat for a lot of people, and then an Etherpad instance, which is just collaborative writing. And we've had some teachers that have... Uh, uh, sort of defied their their institutions, and instead of using uh, you know their own Microsoft 365 instance, they're conducting their whole courses on our Jitsi instance, for example, which shows that it's viable and 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 reasonable to use. Now we don't mean to supplement, but we want to educate and say, don't believe that this is the only thing that you have and it's the only thing available, and, and you can learn the differences of what these two things offer to you. So this is just a, a preview. There's a lot of data that we, we can share in the project that I encourage you to take a look. We're very interested in knowing other people that would be interested in mapping this kind of information. And I leave you with the sites uh, and uh, I'd be uh, welcome to take questions and talk more now or in the future. And thank you again, Antonio, for the very kind invitation. Well, thank you very much, Tel. Uh, and well, congratulations also for this excellent reflection. Um, we'll, um, well, actually, you have um, pointed out one of the major problems that we've been facing, uh, which is the um, the difficulty and unawareness of many uh, of, of the uh, teachers and well, and, and the, also these uh, the educational institutions on the issues related to data privacy and data management and all of this. Uh, but I mean, from your experience. Do you see these uh, in terms of well correcting this problem uh, or solving this problem? Um, uh, do you see these more uh, in the part of action to, uh, regarding policy, action regarding changing the um, well, uh, gi giving more information to teacher staff, uh, also more information to students, developing more a kind of a um, overarching uh, understanding of um, digital citizenship. Uh, what is your view on this? So I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we're doing now. So we're working with the state of Sao Paulo, which is you know has a massive school system. Uh, and when we work with with uh, in the past, when we worked with open policy, uh, we you know we did it with the federal government here as well. We often emphasized and 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 they were really eager to work with OER policy, which I think is a is a great thing. I mean, working with a establishing an open license policy and and identifying stakeholders is great. Now, what we've started to do since 2018 is to say, well, if you want to do an open policy, you're going to do have to do an open education policy, and that means you have to think about terms of use, you have to think about tools, you have to think about privacy and rights, image rights, property rights, and things like that. Uh, and so what we're doing now in the midst of this, this big, big push is trying to, uh, and I think successfully doing this, is getting governments to think about the whole thing. You know, it, you can't think about just open educational resources and licensing. You have to think about all these other issues. And of course, it's a very complex problem. You have, you know, you have contracts that have already been put in place. You have donations that are given. 
Uh, you know, people don't really necessarily see the difference between free and open, and you have to explain those things. And the, the advancement is not necessarily complete. I mean, we can't just block down with one new policy that will change everything. But I think we're trying very hard to raise awareness uh, that these issues exist. And I think that often, uh, uh, you know, public managers and just, uh, you know, administrators are really not quite aware of these things yet. They just don't see how these things connect. And I think this is a, an important thing to include when we're teaching people about these things and creating policy around open. Yes, well, I fully agree with you, Tel. I'll just uh, read to you because I think it's an interesting um, statement that is also a, a question, but uh, mainly uh, uh, some uh, some kind of a statement that is also shared, that is being shared by Petra Aspira. Uh, and so I'll just read it to you as it's on the, on the Q&A. Um, do you think what to, uh, do you think it would be good to come up with a one unified platform for each individual level of education? This is the question. And then she also adds, namely in Croatia, she's from Croatia, there are educational platforms with the, with, within which there are platforms for webinars and online teaching, such as Merlin platform by CRC. This is a, um, a, a, a well, um, uh, an organization from the University of uh, um, uh, in, in Croatia, uh, University of Zagreb. The problem is that different levels of education need different settings, and this is, of course, difficult to synchronize. Also, the issue of knowledge validation achieved in this way is the biggest challenge, and I think that the platform should meet these requirements, offered solutions for to conducting knowledge testing and so on, and most do not provide for this option, but are modified versions of meeting platforms. I uh, just wanted to share this with you. Any comments, Tal? Yeah, for sure. I think I think it's a it's a good point. No, I don't think we we necessarily need to have one platform for everything, but that's well, that's what ends up happening. So one of the things that we've did is we we've uh, questioned every single uh, government and institution through freedom of information. So we have we asked for about I don't know I would probably say six hundred uh, uh, requests for information to get an idea of how these things happen and. And they are very centralized. Uh, you know, when a state decides, a state decides for everybody. Uh, and when a municipality decides, it decides for every single school. And when the university decides, it doesn't ask anybody. It just makes the decision. Uh, no departments, no students are asked. And so we live in, uh, I think, and I'm speaking mostly for, for our you know, South American region. You know, when we've been talking to colleagues from Bolivia, from Peru, from Ecuador and Uruguay, uh, we see this re replicate itself. And so, uh, I think that there's this, this primes us for, for sort of centralized solutions, not one big solution for the whole country and all levels of education that would definitely not work. But, you know, at a state level or at a, at a specific level of education, I think we can provide uh, a framework, which is what we're moving towards next, is like a framework of software that you can use and you can implement that's sustainable and open that people can implement in their own level and make tweaks to if they want to. Uh, I think that there's just no other way around it because we're competing with with uh, with organizations that will offer a one solution for all blanket product that is implemented top down with no discussion. Well, thank you very much, Tel. Uh, well, time flies when we're having fun, and we're actually having fun <laughs> apart from having a wonderful uh, discussion and uh, ex uh, extremely high quality um, uh, content being uh, also shared and experiences being uh, valuable experience being shared and i would like to uh, well to wrap, to wrap up with a, a question that would, would put forward to every one of you every each one of you and uh, would be like this um, uh, we are now entering a new phase after the, the the experience of the pandemic which is this new normal new normality that we're building uh, in which most mm, it is becoming clear for everyone that um, uh, schools will become uh, ever more uh, uh, an hybrid environment. And so, of course, people are, uh, well, teachers, uh, uh, school administrators, uh, well, everyone in the field is preparing for this new normal. Um, bearing in mind your reflection on what happened, uh, on the lessons from the pandemic, uh, my question to all of you is, um, what advice, what kind of uh, um, key points would you like to make uh, as we enter uh, and share with everyone as we enter this next phase, this new normality? And I'll start by Abby. Sure. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I think one of the things that we've learned from the 
from the pandemic and in a lot of the distance learning um, is that it has to be a blend of resources. There isn't any sort of, you know, silver bullet uh, or, you know, fix all. Um, and to take into account the diversity in terms of teacher readiness, in terms of institutional readiness, and in terms of student readiness, um, you know, every kind of person is handling distance learning differently and we need to be respectful of those differences. Um, I consider technology, you know, a great equalizer when it comes to access and equitable, um, you know, opportunity. However, it's really up to the to the humans to make sure that we're deploying that technology uh, in a in a way that that meets the needs of all of our learners. So, um, you know, I think when we when we think about kind of the next wave, it will be how do we respectfully understand the differences and deploy technology uh, and resources so that it. Um, you know, is the, the healthy blend of not 100% online, not, um, you know, 100% in person, but how we uh, are able to blend the modalities of learning uh, for the individual and for the, you know, institution and setting. Yes, thank you very much, Abby. Ag Agda, your input. So, well, I would connect it to what uh, Abby was saying is that I uh, also to for teachers especially to kind of have a bit of patience with themselves as well and and we think that they're very good we we know that if they need support there's plenty of organizations resources that can help but also to not be too harsh on themselves because we've talked to many teachers where it was a big deal about all these changes and and they're doing amazing so you know if you cannot go as fast as other that's of, oh that's okay just adapt what you can and adapt and learn and develop slowly Thank you, Agda. Andrea. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the importance of policy and, and policy at least at three levels. No? Uh, institutional policy, uh, sorry, uh, governmental policies, institutional policies, and even individual policies, because I think that we all have our own policies, no? the way we conduct ourselves professionally in our lives. So uh, to me, it's essential that digital competence remains a priority uh, at a policy level uh, for governments, but not only that, also open education, I think it needs to be back as a priority in the policy in order to increase um, awareness raising. Uh, and in terms of um, um, institutional policies and individual policies, I think that it's, it's about, it's understanding the importance of continuous professional development in, in, in terms of, uh, of the use of digital technologies and the role of openness in this, um, um, and also raise awareness that we have existing platforms that are open and free, um, and that there is a community out there able to share um, uh, experiences. No? So to me, policy is key and continuous professional development of teachers. Thank you very much, Andrea Sophocles, your thoughts? Uh, Antonio, uh, according to my view, um, uh, teachers and uh, schools uh, have uh, performed extremely well in the very demanding uh, situation uh, due to the to the pandemic. So um, my uh, let's say proposal would be to look to two uh, very important issues. That uh, according uh, this is let's say my uh, I think these are the catalysts for um, developing a better a better schooling is to enhance the uh, trust to teachers' professionalism and uh, to offer more autonomy to, uh, to schools. Uh, they have uh, demonstrated uh, uh, both at the individual and at the organizational level that they can perform uh, very well. Thank you very much, Sophocles. Tell your last word. <laughs> Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not doing particularly well. So I don't know if I have really great advice, but uh, <laughs> but I think uh, Agatha said it brilliantly, which is that we need to slow down. I mean, I think we keep demanding that people do uh, amazing things during a pandemic. We're all going to get sick very quickly, um, maybe not from COVID, but you know, mentally sick. So I think slowing down is the best thing that we can do. Well, thank you very much, Tell. And uh, well, I, I think this sums up uh, brilliantly what what was a wonderful session and a great uh, a great debate as well. 
Um, and I, I'm well on the I believe on behalf of everyone here, well the over 100 participants that we had in this session, I would like to thank the the speakers for uh, these uh, excellent presentations, uh, and also thank the participants for the uh, great questions as well. It was a very lively uh, session, and it was a great pleasure for me to to just moderate it. Uh, let me just share uh, a final message, uh, which is this one. Okay. Okay, here it is. Um, please remember that, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, here it is. <laughs> please remember that uh, um, next June, 20, uh, from 22nd to the 25th, we'll have our uh, next uh, annual conference. It will be virtual this year. Again, uh, it will be the Eden 2021 virtual annual conference. And uh, it will be a very special edition. It will be uh, the 30th anniversary uh, conference. Uh, you, you, you have the, um, the link here. You, you can still uh, submit. You're welcome to do it. And um, I hope you will do it. <laughs> we all hope that you will be meeting online uh, again in June, next June, for the celebration of the 30th anniversary of Eden. And of course, uh, to have this wonderful opportunity to share once again our thoughts and experiences uh, together uh, at the annual conference. From my part, uh, once again, uh, thank you very much to everyone. And uh, well, congratulations to, the, to our speakers. And uh, let me wish you all the continuation of a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening to everyone. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.